Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Sue and I have the pleasure of introducing Michael Bernstein, um, coming out from MIT, working with Rob Miller. Um, Michael really needs very little introduction. He's been out here a couple of times for internships, uh, working with four or five different groups. Um, he's now working with MSR New England, um, so he's got plenty of experience with us. Um, you know, Michael's amazingly decorated. He has multiple best papers, best paper awards, um, and has a fellowship in one of ours, um, the MSR Graduate Fellowship. Um, and he's going to tell us about his work over the last couple of years um, combining human and machine intelligence. So, Michael? Thanks. Great. So, yeah, I'm excited to talk to you today about crowd-powered systems. And crowd-powered systems are interactive systems that are going to combine human intelligence from crowds of people collaborating online with machine intelligence. And to set the stage for why this might be a good idea, I'll start with the word processor. And that's because the word processor might be the most heavily designed, heavily used interactive system ever. And like most interactive systems, it tries to support a very complex cognitive process, writing. And it does so by helping with some really complex manipulation tasks. You can think of by now how we've got some relatively efficient algorithms to help with layout. We can build language models to help with spelling, with grammar. But at some level, what we really have very little support for is the core act of writing itself, or, or maybe even editing. Think of questions like expressivity, word choice, or even situations, well, like this. Uh, so how often have we all been in a situation like this where you have an hour or two before a deadline, a strict word or a page limit, and you're a little bit over length? I think we've collectively burned a few more cycles on uh, fixing this kind of situation than we'd like to admit. Now, historically, when you're in this kind of situation, you would turn to other humans, in particular editors. If you were a published author, you could turn to an editor who would help you shorten your text, who would collect uh, things that Microsoft Word didn't catch, for example, spelling or grammar errors. And in a sense, they were really a core part of the writer's toolbox. But this has really never been a part of the toolbox that we could make a permanent part of our software. Because if you wanted to do that, you would have needed these editors to be available at large scale, really at any time. And that just hasn't been possible. But today, we do have tons of people online taking on some really impressive tasks. This is known as crowdsourcing. And you know, even within uh, areas related to computer science, we're using crowds to help collect data from machine learning algorithms. We're running studies on our systems. Even social scientists and economists, are, our behavioral economists, are running large-scale studies using crowdsourcing platforms. We're folding proteins. We're even writing collectively an encyclopedia. And this isn't a new phenomenon. In fact, it goes back to the 1700s when the British royal astronomer started distributing spreadsheets for the calculation of nautical sea charts through the mail. And it reached its original height in the 1930s when a WPA project hired 450 so-called human computers, which is actually the source of the term computer that we use today. But what I'd like to point out is that this lineage of distributed human computation has really acted as a batch platform. That is, you take a lot of your work, you push it over the wall, you wait a while, hours, days, and then eventually you bring it back and run some analysis on it. What I'm going to talk about today are ways in which we can turn crowdsourcing from a batch platform into one that supports interactive systems. That is, rather than having a single human editor help you out with a situation like this, where we're stuck between what the user is willing to do and what the system can support, what if we had tens or thousands of individuals all look at your document, suggest ways that it could be improved or shortened. We could algorithmically start to identify the best of their suggestions and then give you access to them in an interactive system. That's what I mean when I talk about a crowd-powered system. Interactive system, a user interface that supports, that, that combines machine intelligence through whatever we can design or AI with crowd intelligence. Now let's say that we thought this is a good idea. You're going to run into a couple challenges when you try to build these kinds of systems. The first one is quality. Uh, a few weeks ago, I asked 1,000 people online to flip a coin. 
and to type H if they got heads and T if they got tails. So hopefully in this room it would be about 50-50. Um, turns out on the internet there's actually about a two to one ratio of heads to tails. <laughs> and this is not exactly that the internet's a biased coin. It's that people are trying to optimize for money, they start satisficing, they try to generate randomness, and when people are trying to generate randomness, they do so in non-random ways. Uh, in fact, you might notice that this doesn't actually add up to 100%. That's because fully 7% of the respondents didn't type H or T. They actually went outside of the grammar, if you will, and typed out the entire word. They misspelled it, or they wrote the enigmatic F. And these are, these are the kinds of interesting challenges that we need to, to face when we start talking about integrating crowd contributions, voluntary, voluntary or otherwise, into software systems. Because algorithms may not expect this. A second challenge is going to be speed or latency. If we're building interactive systems, we expect them to react quite quickly. Uh, and crowdsourcing just does not react that quickly. Uh, in fact, when it first came out, people were very excited about it, saying that it's extremely fast, and then pointed out that it was 48 hours before they got a response. Uh, in, in, fa in fact, some folks at UC Berkeley ran a survival analysis model and found that the half-life for uh, responses in these kinds of systems varies between 12 hours, two days, roughly, depending on how much you're offering in a paid crowdsourcing context. We really need to cut this down by orders of magnitude if we want to have interactive systems. So today I'm going to show that we can, in fact, create these crowd-powered systems, that we can overcome these challenges with quality and with latency and embed crowd intelligence in, into our everyday interactions. And that in order to do that, I'm going to introduce several computationally motivated techniques that help crowds accomplish these tasks that they wouldn't otherwise be able to accomplish. Again, overcoming these challenges of quality and of latency. Now I'm going to focus for most of the talk on paid crowdsourcing. I'll come back near the end to talk about how we can use other kinds of crowds uh, to take on lots of tasks that paid crowdsourcing would never be able to do. But for the moment, uh, you may have heard of Amazon Mechanical Turk is perhaps the most popular paid crowdsourcing platform. On Mechanical Turk, there are millions of tasks that are, that are done, things that look like this, label an image, transcribe a short audio clip, for, for small amounts of money, usually on the order of a few cents. And people do a large number of these and hopefully make up a reasonable amount of money. If you look at the population on, the, on systems like this, it's about 40% in the US, 40% in India, 20% elsewhere. And across a variety of indices, gender, education, income, it mirrors the overall population distributions, which suggests that you really have some relatively educated individuals on these platforms who are looking to supplement or completely replace their existing income. We're going to use paid crowdsourcing to explore this notion of crowd-powered systems. I'm orienting my talk around two main systems. The first is Soylent. It's a word processor with a crowd inside which will hopefully convince you that this entire idea is worth pursuing. And second is adrenaline, which takes these concepts and makes them happen in real time, quite quickly. I'll start with Soylent. Uh, Soylent is people. It's a word processor that's recruiting crowds as core elements of the user interface. Now, I'd like to point out before I start that I'm actually not the first person to come up with this name. You may know one Danielle Fisher, uh, who handed the name off to me at some point. Um, <laughs> What I, what I hope you take away from this section is that we're really embedding crowd contributions as a core part of how this system works, and that we're going to take something that crowds aren't potentially very good at and decompose it in such a way that we can actually focus individuals' efforts and get higher quality responses. So rather than tell you about Soylent, I'm actually going to show it to you. So this is Soylent running on the uh, Soylent paper, which is a little meta. Uh, but let's, this is exactly the situation we pointed out earlier where we're a little bit over length. Let's say that we decided this conclusion is a bit too long. Uh, rather than shortening it myself, I'm going to actually ask for some help. I'm going to push it off to one thing that, that Soylent does called shorten. When I, when I push this, um, Soylent's going to push a bunch of tasks off to Mechanical Turk. You don't need to pay too much attention to the details here, but you can see that workers are marking up the text, they're making some edits, they're doing some votes. When it all comes back, We've collected all of these suggestions that the workers made, and we can start to put them all together. What you see here is on the left, my original text, and on the right, everything that has been marked up. Anything that's underlined in purple here is a section of the text that has been marked up as being shortenable, a patch, we call it. And you can see that with every patch has a number of different options that have been suggested as potential rewrites that are, short, that are shorter. We can then consider the space of all possible paragraphs, order them by length, and uh, give you a slider so that when you drag the slider, the text rewrites itself and becomes shorter 
or longer, or really anywhere in between. And hopefully when you're done, your text is now on 10 pages. <laughs> this shows you a new kind of interaction we can build by, by, by talking to crowd intelligence. But we can also talk about how we might support existing AI systems. Crowdproof is a, is a crowdsourced uh, copy editor, effectively. It's going to find errors that Microsoft Word didn't and indicate solutions and give you plain English suggestions of, of what's the problem. You can see here that the crowd has suggested uh, that this paragraph has two potential problems with it. You can see that they've explained in one case the sentence is too long. In another, in another case here, there's actually a parallel sentence structure error. Uh, so introducing is the correct way of putting it. The interesting thing about this second one is that this error got past, I think, eight authors and six reviewers before Crowdproof caught it before a camera ready deadline. The reason is that this is at the bottom of page five. And by the time we're reading and getting to the bottom of page five, our eyes are getting a little bit tired. But crowd members are coming in with many different perspectives, and they're perhaps even seeing this text as the first thing they see. So there's a lot of different there's a lot of different reasons here why we can, that was not crowd powered, uh, why we might actually want to draw on the crowds here. Now we can also talk about how crowds might support natural kinds of input to a system. In particular, I tend to write like this. I leave my, uh, my, my citations in brackets like this and I need to come back later and fill in and, and write out a bibliography. In particular, uh, if I'm using something that takes in BibTeX as, as input, I need to go find that metadata. Let's say I wanted to ask for help with that we can push out to something we call the human macro. Not everything can be proofreading or, or shortening. This allows you sort of open-ended requests. So in this case, I might just ask for help finding the bib tech for the citations in brackets. And uh, rather than writing this myself, I'm actually gonna show you what one of our, one of our user study participants created. Um, you can tell it's a little bit unclear. Uh, you can locate these by Google Scholar searches and cl clicking on bib tech. Uh, not the clearest thing in the world, but we'll go ahead and paste it in. We can say how many people we want to help, how much we want to pay them. And when it comes back, you'll see something that looks like this, where they've gone out to Google Scholar, figured out what we meant, and brought back the VibTech. That, in short, is Soylent. Soylent's goal is to reach out to these crowd, crowd contributions to create new kinds of interactive systems. Interactive sent, uh, shortening, a new kind of interaction, so, uh, aid with, with proofreading, supporting an AI system, and open-ended requests like the human rat crow. Find me a figure, and because it's the internet, they'll find you cats. These are the kinds of things that we think are possible when you engage with crowds as a core part of interaction. Now, if you were to try and build a system like Soylent, uh, you might come up against some interesting challenges, as I pointed out earlier. Uh, in particular, we've worked with a lot of, of Mechanical Turk workers on these kinds of systems, and we, we simply see that roughly a third of what we get back, or 30%, is just not something you'd want to show to a user, particularly not a user who might be paying for such a system. And we need to actually deal with this quality issue if we want to make such a system really large-scale deployable. So why is this happening? I'll explain it through a couple of personas. I took this paragraph off of a high school essay website. Uh, it's, it's a really horrible paragraph. I've just underlined a few of the issues with it here. And we asked Mechanical Turk workers to, in an open-ended sense, just edit it, make it better, proofread it. Uh, and you see two kinds uh, of personas here. One we would call the lazy worker. This is someone who is trying to optimize for money and send a clear signal that they've done the work, but do no more than they really need to. So given this, this really error-filled paragraph, a lazy worker is going to do something like this. Uh, that is, they made a one character change to the word comradeship to fix the spelling. And it's not surprising they, they did that because it was the only word that was underlined in their browser as being misspelled. <laughs> but they made a clear edit. On the other end of the effort spectrum, there's the eager beaver. This is someone who's also trying to give a signal that they've done the work, but they sort of go too far. They go outside the bounds of what the system might expect. Given the same paragraph, uh, an eager beaver will make some, some good fixes, but then they're also gonna insert new lines between every sentence, which is not something I personally would, imp would consider an improvement to the text. <laughs> and these personas are not sp specific to Mechanical Turk. You can think about, say, Wikipedia, where you have some workers who are working quite hard to try and make edits, but sort of getting reverted because they don't know the rules. You have other people who are just getting by. 
And in my, in my opinion, the state of programming with crowds in the loop is still very early days. And in my view, it's sort of similar to before we had patterns like model view controller and so on that started to codify best practices such that you could get reliably better results. So our goal here is going to be to start thinking about what such design patterns might be in the crowd computing space. I'll introduce one that, we've, that we use in Soylent called Find, Fix, Verify. The notion is that this design pattern is oriented toward these open-ended problems, like the things that Soylent tackles. I can I comp contrast it to a closed-ended problem, something like a multiple choice test, uh, where you can upload some small percentage of ground truth and use that to compare and figure out whether the work is good. Here there's a huge space of possibly correct answers. What we're going to do is we're going to decompose this very open-ended problem into, into three stages which are slightly less open-ended and give workers more direction. I'll explain it through an example. We use this both with proofreading but, and shortening. I'll show you with shortening here. Rather than having workers directly edit the text, we're first going to have them just find areas of the text that can be edited. We're going to effectively get a heat map over, say, the paragraph. We're going to look for independent agreement across workers to, sort of, to certify an area of the text as a patch. And we're going to send each patch out in parallel to a fixed stage. In the fixed stage, we're going to show what each, uh, another set of workers exactly one of these issues and ask them to fix it. That is, to shorten the text, to, to fix the typo depending on the, on the, on the, on the uh, text. We're going to collect a bunch of these suggestions, randomize their order, and put them through a verify stage. The verify stage is going to try to enforce some invariance here. Basically, we want to make sure that we're not changing the intended meaning of the text and that we're not introducing any new style or grammar errors. Anything that survives uh, the verification stage, we can finally pass back to the application logic and, uh, in particular here, create something like shorten. OK, so why is this a good idea? In particular, why would we split find from fix? Why not just let workers go in and sort of improve the text? Well, one major reason is that we're actually taking advantage of these two personas I introduced. In the find stage, we can force the lazy workers to find two or three different errors in the text which gives them a, a lower bound that they can understand and we can understand. And in the fixed stage, we can point these lazy workers at a problem that is perhaps not the easiest one. And they can't sort of get away without having done, fixed that particular problem. So by giving them a more specific task, we actually end up producing higher quality results. At the same time, we can focus the eager workers on a task that we really want accomplished right now and help, hopefully keep them from going too far off the rails. It also allows us to group the suggestions, so we can get that drop down. If you've ever passed out a draft and then gotten a bunch of different edits that are confusing, uh, what we know now is that given a particular problem, these three edits are all different ways to fix it. So you don't have to actually do that merging yourself. The notion behind the verify stage is that we get higher quality output by putting these workers in productive tension with each other. So you have one set of workers whose goal is to try and suggest options, and another set of workers whose goal is to consider critically whether that was, those are correct. Uh, I'd like to point out that while, while this was somewhat early in the space, there's really a growing literature, um, much of which was done here in fact, that's playing into this larger space of what happens when we combine crowds and algorithms. Yeah. Why verify rather than a more general rank, which would allow you to say show two possible solutions to someone and have them pick the better one? So it's, it's actually agnostic. With crowdproof, we just try to pick the end best, like oh, this, the one best, because we want to make one edit, right? With, with, with shorten, we actually just want to filter out anything bad and sort of get a, a general rank, because we just want to continue, uh, we, we want a set of as many options as possible. But you could imagine doing a rank, uh, and then you'd, you'd have to assume where some cutoff would be. But certainly there are many different ways you could run a verification stage. This is just one way. Did that address your question? Um, I think so. Okay. Well. Come back later if, if I'm still being confusing. Uh, we wanted to know whether this worked. Uh, in particular, we wanted to know three things. Uh, how high is the quality? What does this look like? How long do you have to wait? And how much is it going to cost? So we can throw a bunch of input texts at Soylent. In particular, here's Shorten. Uh, here are five different input texts we gave it, ranging from TechCrunch, uh, HCI papers, OS papers, and my personal favorite, a rambling email from the Enron corpus, and feed it through Soylent and get edits that look something like this. Now across all of these texts, we see that we cut about 15% of the original paragraph length on average. 
What this means is that you can take an 11 page draft of a paper, hold constant, the title, the figure, all that boilerplate, run it through shorten, and get a 10 page paper back without having changed any of your core arguments. So why does this work? How does it work? Workers tend to avoid any sort of technical content they don't understand and instead focus on wordy phrases. Uh, in particular, in this case, the phrase are going to have to can be shortened to have to without changing the meaning of the text too much. And these are exactly the sets of phrases that we can start to collect a corpus of and train a machine learning system to take over much faster and, and for free, just have the crowd take over a verification stage. Now they make more complex edits as well. For example, merging sentences. This sentence now reads the larger tangible bits project, comma, which introduced the MetaDesk and two companion platforms. Okay, but this does not always work. Uh, here's some interesting ways in which it fails. One is that workers are not a member of your community of practice. Uh, that is, they're not experts, and they might mistake their expertise. Uh, there's a signaling phrase in academia. We say, in this paper, we argue that. Uh, workers just find it boring. <laughs> so you may disagree, legitimately. Um, so expertise is one issue. Another one, which is endemic, has to do with parallelism. That is, workers in one patch can't see what the workers in the other patch are doing. So in this case, you have two list items, and they cut the main phrase from one and the parenthetical from the other, which leaves the resulting sentence somewhat meaningless. If you wanted to fix this, you would either need to talk about enforcing global constraints, which is what Hao Chi and Eric have been looking at, uh, or starting to merge patches when they get too close together. OK. So we, across these three stages, are really recruiting hundreds of people for each of these texts. Costs about $1.25 a paragraph. Uh, if you're willing to wait longer, it can get down to about 30 cents. And from there, you can start talking about optimizing and, and sort of in decision theoretic terms, trying to minimize the number of workers you would need for each stage to optimize some global quality constraint. Now, how long do you have to wait? There are two types of wait time in Soylent. The first is between when Soylent asks for help and when a worker says, OK, I'm going to help you out. Uh, and now if you sum the median find, the median fix, and the median verify, you see about, this takes about 18 and a half minutes. Now it can take much longer, this can stall. But roughly, you're looking at about 20 minutes. The second wait time has to do with when the worker, between when the worker says they'll help and they actually complete the task. And again, if you sum the medians, this is actually much faster, it's about two minutes. Now in the second half of the talk, I'm gonna show ways in which we can get that uh, 18 and a half minutes down by several orders of magnitude. But, in, but you're looking at it perhaps in the limit about a two minute wait between when you ask for help and when Soylent can get back to you. So uh, we can do the same thing with CrowdProof. We can give it lots of different input text, bad Wikipedia pages, uh, text which passes words grammar checker, and the one at the top, which is uh, an essay written by a non-native English speaker. I'll focus on that one. You can see some of the edits that it makes. Uh, Word by itself finds about one third of these errors. CrowdProof finds about two thirds of them. And interestingly, they find different errors, which is to say if you combine them, you get about 82% coverage. When it finds an error, CrowdProof fixes it about 90% of the time. So when does it miss? Most commonly, when there are two errors in the same patch. And the lazy workers come in and fix the obvious one, but don't notice the more detail, uh, subtle one. So the same process is happening over and over. Human macro, same thing. You can see the, exactly the text that I pasted in earlier, other things like finding figures, changing the tense of a document. Um, I'll focus again on the first one. The input text looks something like this. Uh, in fact, if you're familiar with the literature, you know that this is an incorrect citation. Duncan Watts is one person, not two. Uh, but the workers still manage to figure out a noisy input and a noisy command and get the correct answer. Now, there's no verification stage here, which means that the 30% rule comes back. So we see that about 70% of the time, these things are, are perfect. And about 90%, they have the right idea, but some subtle error in them. So, so far I've introduced you to Soylent, which has introduced this new space of interactive systems that are powered by crowd contributions. And in order to do this, I've introduced the find, fix, verified design pattern to you, which has started to focus these contributions to, to address questions with quality. Yes? Could you hand on what percentage of the workers end up actually contributing edits that survive verification? Where verification is. What percentage of the like, like are all, Do you have a lot of lazy workers who end up giving you totally useless things? So what you're asking is, is there a high correlation? If you give me bad things now, will you give me bad things later? Uh, that, yes. That would, yes. Sure. Uh, 
My sense is yes, I don't have numbers for you there. Certainly there's a power law of contribution in, in most of these things, such that a small number of workers are actually producing a large amount of, uh, of your results. Um, there, are, there are lots of folks who think about sort of this global quality management. Crowdflower is a good example of someone who maintains sort of across many tasks. Uh, and I think the first thing you'd want to do is start to build up a, a better notion of reputation, either as the platform like Mechanical Turk or Odesk can do this better than any individual requester, or as a requester, we can start to get feedback from the user saying, I like that edit. That edit was really bad. And we can sort of propagate backward. My really question is, do any of these eager beavers are? What's their deal and why they're, why they're eager? So often, uh, I don't have deep knowledge. That is, I think you would want to spend more time talking to them to get the sense. But there's sort of this notion that you're, you're overcompensating. Sometimes this has to do with if you have an interesting task or it's the first one, you sort of don't know the task parameters yet or the boundary conditions. Um, I think that's one thing that's going. I think often it has to do with them overestimating their abilities as well. Like, yes, I'll just insert new lines. You know, not a good idea. Yeah? So you mentioned that this incentives, like the payment, uh, yeah. affect the speed. But did you also say that incentive affected the quality of the work? No, in fact, um, that uh, Winter Mason and Duncan Watts paper demonstrated that paying more gets you more work that is faster, uh, but no, no, no increase in quality. Um, in general, that's, that's what we see. You, you need to design your task better to get high, higher quality results. Um, which I think is, as an HCI person, that's nice to hear. That means that I can actually have an impact. <laughs> okay, so at this point I'll turn to adrenaline, which is going to take these ideas and push them into the real time space. The reason we want to do this is that the kinds of applications we can build are really constrained in a very deep way by latency. Now, while Soylent was one of the first crowd-powered systems, I can actually turn to the broader research literature that has started to explore this space much, in a much broader way than even I could alone, showing that it's, it's useful for design, health and nutrition, robotics, vision, many other kinds of things. Um, but fundamentally, all of these applications are constrained by the same limit as Soylent, which is that sort of 20-minute wait time. In fact, the best result we've seen in the literature comes out of Jeff Bigham's group at University of Rochester, which is able to get one response from a worker about 60 seconds after you ask. And that response isn't verified because it's a singleton. And if that's the best we can do, we've already lost because usability psychology has demonstrated that users will only pay attention to an interaction at max for 10 seconds. They'll lose the flow. So what we really need to create are on-demand, flash, real-time crowds. That's our goal here. We're going to pick one motivating application, which is going to be adrenaline, a camera. That is, for novices, sort of built into your, into your, uh, into your cell phone. And what it's going to do is, for the kinds of situations uh, pushed out beyond what Mike's been working on, we try to sort of find aesthetically, subjectively, the right moment to take the photo. So it's sort of the moment camera, uh, but crowd powered. We want to do this in real time, because ever since the introduction of the digital camera, it's become a core part uh, of, of our photo taking experience that you take the photo, you see the result, we can take another one, you can share it with your friends. We don't want to go back to an era where you have to develop your film overnight. So this is the kind of thing that, uh, that adrenaline looks like. You can see that they're capturing a video of, of people uh, doing high fives there. One of them is me. Uh, and as of right now, we just made a request to the workers to help us choose the best frame. They're going to poke in along the bottom there, start exploring the space, and very quickly they'll Focus in on the final frame now. So just a few seconds later, we have a final frame. Here are a few other kinds of uh, pictures that adrenaline takes. You can see people trying different angles, uh, different kinds of, of poses, uh, action shots, like people jumping off of a bench, or people just being silly and hoping that the crowd will, will pick a cute moment. And again, we can collect data from these kinds of systems and start to train more automatic ones as we push out. So if we want to create adrenaline, we need to solve two problems. And these correspond to the two wait times I pointed out before. The first is how we get the crowds there quickly. And in order to do this, I'm going to introduce a new recruitment approach for crowdsourcing that we call the retainer model. The idea behind the retainer model is that we're going to ask workers to come and sign up before we need their help. And we're going to actually pay them a little bit extra uh, while they can, they can go do anything else. They can work on other tasks. They can check their email. They can chat. But as soon as we have a task for them, they've sort of implicitly agreed to come back. When we have a task, we just pop up a simple JavaScript alert, brings their, their attention to, the, to our browser tab, and we go from there. So does this bring people back 
quickly? Uh, it's an empirical question. In fact, in the space of HCI kinds of questions, it's one of the most measurable. Uh, so we ran a, a study on Mechanical Turk, uh, counterbalanced across days of the week, times of day. And what we did is we had people sign up for a task, and then we called them back. So I'm going to draw a graph here. On the x-axis, you're going to see how long it took between when workers uh, saw this, this dismissal and when they clicked the OK button and started working. And on the y-axis, you're going to see a CDF. What percentage of all of the workers clicked the OK button at least that quickly? They were randomized into different wait time buckets. So if the workers weren't waiting very long, you saw a curve that looks something like this. If they're waiting a little bit longer, a curve that looks more like this. What you can take from this is that if the workers are waiting under, five, under 10 minutes, you get about half of them back two seconds after you ask. And in fact, you get about three quarters of them back three seconds after you ask. Now, what happens if they've uh, been assigned to wait longer? Now you see more attrition. But in a separate experiment, we found that if you offer a small bonus, you can take a curve that looks something like this, that is like a 25% chance of this worker coming back, and push it all the way back up as if the worker hadn't been waiting at all. So we changed the incentives, we changed the behavior. So I, noticed, I said that we're paying about a, a, half cent, a, a, a half cent a minute into the sort of expected wait time. So it costs about 30 cents an hour to have someone on retainer. Now, even just with this, we're, we can create some real-time kinds of applications. We built one called AB that sort of crowdsources traditional uh, kinds of instant votes. So if I want to know which, which tie to wear today or which of these two designs people like better, uh, over here on the right, you're going to see a Go button. I'm just going to click the Go button, and then we're going to replay a result from one of our studies. So this is something that took 20 minutes with Soylent, uh, 60 seconds with Jeff Bigham's work, and we get five votes in about five seconds. So this is the kind of thing that the retainer model can do. Crowds in two seconds, and traditional crowdsourcing kinds of tasks in about five seconds. And that's great if what you're trying to do is uh, choose between two photos. But adrenaline's not. Uh, in particular, it's trying to choose between, say, 100 or more photos all at once. So what happens now is that the workers arrive quickly, but it takes them a long time to actually shuttle between those last few frames and choose the best frame. So how are we going to help them find that decisive moment? How do we help the workers work together in order to, to overcome these slow work times? And we're going to take advantage of one notion here, um, which is that we really have created synchronous crowds. For the first time, you can assume that all of these crowd workers are arriving at once, not sort of arriving and leaving at, you know, at, at individual whim, as you usually have on Mechanical Turk. And we can start to think about how we could get them to work together. In particular, I'm going to claim that if we're smart about this, we can get the crowd to work faster collaboratively than even the single fastest member of that crowd. The way we're going to do that is through a technique we call rapid refinement. And in a continuous search space, like what we have with adrenaline, the notion with rapid refinement is to look for agreement early as it's starting to emerge, before people would have made their final selection, and use that to reduce the search space quickly and focus everyone's attention. So I'll explain what we mean with pseudocode here. On the left, you see what the server has. On the right, there are three workers who get initialized to random positions in the video. Uh, the server sees all of them. And we're going to start looping until we get down to a single frame. We're going to look for agreement. We're just going to say how many workers are within a particular region of, of this video. Right now, there are none. And we're going to wait until there's a certain amount of agreement, say 2 thirds. As the workers start navigating through the space, there's still no agreement. Eventually, you'll see that two folks do come together, indicating that they're interested in the same region. Rather than immediately jumping forward, we're going to make sure it's not a false positive. So we're going to make sure they stay in that region for two seconds. If they do, we're going to certify this as a refinement. Reduce the search space so those folks who agreed can stay exactly where they were. Anyone who disagreed won't get paid yet and will get reinitialized to a random new part of the video. And we're going to keep doing this again and again until we get down to a single frame. This is how rapid refinement works. I'm going to show you exactly the same video I showed you before, uh, just focused on the bottom part. So you're going to see that workers arrive, and very quickly they're going to start agreeing on a th that central region. We're going to have a refinement, and then an overlapping another refinement down to a single frame. So just a few seconds. Now, what came out of this? That is, does this work? Do we have some sort of quality time trade-off happening here? Uh, and when we have low quality results, what's going on? Yes, Sumit. 
Uh, it seems like there is an underlying assumption that there is a kind of single uh, best place because if you have multiple of your error functions. Yeah, so if there's a five mole distribution. Yeah, I guess a problem with there. Like, but is, is that generally the assumption that you know, the, the, the video is taken with one kind of optimal place? We assume that there's one intent, but you don't actually. The nice thing about crowds is that they're sort of. There are many of them. So what you can do, although we don't do it in the current implementation, is just fork, right? So you can, you can imagine these, this as populating some probability distribution. And if you see two peaks, you can just sort of put one set of people over here and one set of people over here, or just focus on one for now. And then you can wheel around when you have more time to explore the second one. Um, and I'll point out another reason in a minute why that might be a good idea. Yeah? One more quick question. What, um, what's the final dollar amount that you were paying for finding that frame? When you I'll show you in, in just a moment. Okay. Um, so yeah, cost is going to be another element here. So we actually had uh, 34 folks, I think, from our university come in and take uh, video photos from this. Uh, and we produced five different candidate frames from each of these, uh, each of these input videos. Uh, one of these frames was generated using rapid refinement, as I described here. Uh, a second one was effectively a ground truth. We had a professional photographer come in and choose that best moment. And third was a, an off-the-shelf production level computer vision algorithm for choosing aesthetic or representative frames within video. You can think of this effectively as what YouTube want, does when it chooses a single frame to represent your video. Uh, the other two techniques were more crowdsourcing oriented. Generate and vote looks a lot like find, fix, verify. We call people in off retainer, they nominate frames, we call people, more people off retainer, and they vote amongst those frames. Generate one just takes the first response we get in generate and vote. That is the fastest member of the crowd. As soon as they produce anything, we just take it. So we can measure two things. One is, uh, sorry, three things: cost, latency, and quality. We'll start with quality. So uh, we can have these these people rate on a nine-point Likert scale how much they thought that the photo was was what they were looking for, that they like it. And what we see is that rapid refinement tends to do uh, statistically better than computer vision, which chooses a different moment, and statistically is indistinguishable from the photographer due to large variance. Now, typically you see something that looks like this, where the crowd chooses uh, something in the same general area, but not exactly the same frame. And on the top row, they were actually just one frame apart. Uh, sometimes you see something like this, though, where you notice this is a bad photo. The guy's eyes are closed, it's blurry. So what happened here? We actually had a false positive. You had two workers who were interested in nearby regions of the video that didn't overlap, but they were close enough to each other that the, sy that the system thought they were interested in the intersection. It snapped down, and they were left with a region of the video that had nothing good. So if you wanted to catch this, you would need to sort of notice thrashing behavior and be able to pop back out and explore a different area. OK, so here I can answer your question about cost. Rapid refinement was about 20 cents a photo. Um, and then it went up from there. So in, what I would hope you would take from here is that rapid refinement was actually not only the fastest, <clears throat> but it was the most reliably fast. It statistically had the least variance, which I would claim is really important for interactive systems. You don't want something that reacts quickly sometimes. You want it to sort of be reliably reacting quickly. Uh, and really what's happening here is that we're pulling up the tail. Sometimes you really do have fast individuals, uh, but sometimes you don't. And rapid refinement can identify that longer tail, or that, I'm sorry, it takes that longer tail and pushes that probability mass to the left. Generate and vote still performs in under a minute, uh, which is much faster than Soylent, and in fact matches the quality of the photographer, which we thought was pretty cool. Yeah? I'm a little confused about the second, uh, the second row there, because it seems like, I mean, generate one, uh, if you're using the same retainer scheme as you are in your first one, it seems like that should be pushed even further towards zero because it's the very first person that responds to anything whereas in the, in the uppercase you're talking about there's some cascading. So, some, so it is pushed a little bit close, farther to zero. If, if you want to like take your eyeglasses, you can see that it's actually sort of one unit left. Oh, but they still have to scan the whole thing. And they still have to scan the entire thing. It takes them some time to get called off retainer. Uh, and we, you know, we, we, you were, we're just taking the first one. So we have five people on retainer. We call them all back, and we only pay attention to the first one. So sometimes you randomly don't have a fast person in your crowd. So that's really what's happening here. OK, so we make a few trade-offs. Uh, one strength is that we actually get fast preliminary results. So within that 10-second boundary, we can return uh, something to the users. And that happens on average within uh, that first refinement happens within 10 seconds. Uh, we also don't need a separate verification stage, because verification is effectively built into this algorithm. We're looking for agreement as we go. 
But we do sacrifice some things. We're sacrificing some amount of quality, as we saw, to get, to get this speed trade-off. You can think of this roughly like randomized algorithms where you're getting a not potentially optimal result, but something that's much faster. So you have, you can, you have this trade-off now. And more importantly, in my opinion, is the fact that we're actually stifling individual creativity in the system. Uh, and this is not ad just adrenaline and rapid refinement. Fine, fix, verify does the same thing. Most crowdsourcing systems all have this uh, regression to the mean effectively happening. Imagine you were the photographer in the crowd. You would have no special ability to actually pull the crowd toward what you know to be a, a good result. If you want to push forward in this, I think you want to start talking about automatically identifying these experts, as we were talking about earlier, and giving them a privileged position within, the, uh, within these systems and these algorithms. Now, in terms of generalizability, rapid refinement, we think, really applies to sort of single-dimensional continuous search spaces, largely. Uh, just within photography, you can think about brightness, contrast, color curves, these kinds of things. So by combining the retainer model and rapid refinements, we're able to execute these really large searches in a human perceptual space within about 10 seconds. And this allows us to turn around and start asking these same kinds of questions about, say, creativity support kinds of applications. This is Photoshop. Uh, let's say you were creating a poster uh, for, for a rock concert and you wanted to have a, a, band of scre or a, a crowd of screaming individuals in, in the audience. Uh, this puppet warp tool allows you to author uh, control points, sort of like Takeo Igarashi's work, and you can drag it. Um, and then let's say we call people off of retainer and, make, and say, make that person look excited. We can have a bunch of individuals do that manipulation. We can take all of their suggestions, draw them back into a layer in Photoshop, and produce something that looks like this. <laughs> so in particular, with about eight workers on retainer, you start getting feedback in a couple seconds. You get your first figure in a half minute. And we went out to several hundred figures and kept getting new ones every three seconds on average. So we think we've really closed the loop here and connected this back to a productivity style, creativity support desktop application that's allowing you to sort of draw on this crowd intelligence as, as you need for, for things that perhaps you would never think of. Now I'll back off here for a moment and point out that the retainer model has started to systematize the recruitment process for crowdsourcing. We're changing that recruitment process. And by systematizing it, we can actually begin to model it and ask what happens when we go from having, say, 20 people on retainer to huge numbers. I won't go into too much detail here, but it turns out that you can cast the retainer model using queuing theory. Uh, that is, it, this is just a formal framework that allows you to sort of understand that if workers are arriving at some rate, you can recruit new workers, uh, tasks are arriving at some rate, and you can recruit new workers at some other rate. It asks questions about how long is the queue, the line. And uh, in particular, this is an MMCC queue, which is to say we have C workers on retainer. And if we have any more than that number of requests, we're just going to give them a busy signal. So now we can ask, what's the probability that when I need help, that is, there's a task, there's no one left on re retainer to help me. We can derive this from Erlang's loss formula in queuing theory. It's this pi of C you see here as a closed form formula. You can also ask, what's the expected number of workers on retainer, which gives you a better sense of cost. You can then plot those two things against each other and treat it as a minimization problem. You can say, how few workers do I need on retainer to, qual to, to have some guarantee of service, like a 1 in 10,000 chance that when someone wants to help, there's no one left to help them. This has lots of other applications. You can think about asking, you can model what happens when you share retainer pools across applications. Uh, you can ask what happens when you then start routing tasks to workers to avoid starvation. Or you can do what we call predictive recruitment or pre-recruitment, which is this notion that if we, if we know that the, on average, a task is going to arrive within the next 10 seconds and that workers will maintain their attention for up to 10 seconds, we can actually recall the worker before we have the task. Show them a loading screen for a moment. And when we do that, we actually see that we can get feedback in just a half second. It really starts to blur this cognitive boundary between me pressing a button and seeing feedback as sort of cognitively part of that, of that action. So you can push farther on this, but I'll, I'll back off here. We'll say, at this point, I hope I've convinced you that we can create real-time crowd-powered systems and that we can introduce techniques in order to support these, things like the retainer model and rapid refinement. So yes, question. So you created a, a model of, of human behavior uh, by, by giving people these incentives to stick around and wait for your response. And so you're basically one economic entity in the system who's done this. Uh, and 
The question is, right, uh, just as in any type of arbitrage system, what happens when everyone else starts running arbitrage? Right. Will this is exactly what do the same. Right. This is exactly why we want to start asking and modeling what happens when we combine retainers across requesters. And what, what I want to put forward is that the platform could actually support this. You can imagine having two sets of tasks. There's the real-time tasks and the non-real-time or batch style tasks. And you could sort of agree to follow, like in the sense of Twitter, like I like that requester, that kind of task, that kind of task, that kind of task. And just give them to me as they come. Otherwise, I'm going to start picking up tasks. And then the system can actually consider the space of everything I've signed up for, the space of everything else people have signed up for, and the tasks that are coming in, and then route them to actually sort of keep a, a globally optimal solution. So it's definitely possible right now on Mechanical Turk to do that kind of arbitrage, right? Uh, I'm trying to push forward and say, how would you design the next platform to avoid that kind of problem? But your, your concern is absolutely valid given where we are now. So you're assuming a monopolist buyer. I'm assuming a what? Monopolist buyer. That, that is, there's, there's one system making the bidding that makes the rules and that, that handles all the requests out to, uh, out to the workers. Uh, I mean, it's, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a monopolist buyer, but it, you, could, you could imagine that way. It's platform support, or you could, you could be like Crowdflower or Middleman, right? Where I will help you get real-time workers, right? And you just sign up through me, and I'll, and I'll, I'll help you. There, but yes, effectively, we're talking in that case about what happens when we centralize. I think if you start splitting and everyone's competing for real-time workers, it would work, just not as well, right? For exactly the reason that you, that you, that's your intuition. Okay, so uh, across these two systems, I hopefully, hopefully I've convinced you so far that we can create these crowd-powered interfaces, uh, these interactive systems that are supporting the kinds of tasks that we could traditionally not support with computing systems, sort of this line between user and system. Now there's a third dimension, effectively, of crowd. So that we can create these interactive systems that embed crowd intelligence, and that in order to do that, we can actually start to look toward computationally motivated techniques to help the crowds accomplish these tasks. Now at the beginning, I promised that I would push past paid crowds, and I'm going to do that now. There are actually many different kinds of crowds out there on the web. We can pay crowds, we can create new kinds of crowds, uh, we can mine the activities that crowds have already uh, have, have gone and, and taken on, upon themselves. And I just want to give you a brief tour through sort of that bigger space, because I actually like to play across all of them um, with several citations to work I did here, actually. I'll start with designing new kinds of social computing systems. But in particular, if you wanted to create a crowd that never existed before. This is work that tends to appear at HCI conferences like Kai and WIST, as well as social computing conferences like ICWSM. Our goal here is to create new kinds of social systems that never existed, and to understand how to design those systems. Now, I'll give one example. This is work that I did with Eric and Desney and Greg and several others um, on friend sourcing. The notion here is that we may actually want information that a generic crowd would never know. So, in particular, if I wanted to know what to get Desney for his birthday, uh, Mechanical Turk would have no idea, Yahoo Answers has no idea, but people in this room, his social network, really do. And by creating incentives over the social network, we can encourage people, I should say Mary was also involved in this work, sorry. Um, this is what happens when you're on the spot. Uh, uh, the, uh, to encourage them to, to share these tags. Many people in this room, in fact, were, were some of Calabio's biggest users. We got tens of thousands of tags on thousands of individuals. Um, in a follow-up, we created a system called FeedMe that starts to effectively learn models of people's interests by, by writing on this activity of people sharing interesting news with each other. And when we do this, we can create systems like this. Uh, we can route questions, like does IUI research tend to appear at, at the WIST conference? Um, these individuals are tagged with both kinds of uh, uh, with both IUI and WIST, but they never had to sit there and tag themselves with their interests. We were taking advantage of the fact that there's a power law here, that we can take a small number of individuals who are really active on these social networks and spread out their, their interests and activities such that it's to the benefit of everyone else in the social network. We can also ask what happens when we take unusual designs in, 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 uh, in the space of social computing systems. Um, in particular, you may have heard of 4chan or slash B, um, they, they created the Anonymous Hacker Collective, which you may have heard of. It's sort of a heterodox community, to say the least. It's a, an unusual place in the internet. I don't recommend checking it during the talk. Um, now, they make some really interesting decisions. One is that, by default, all posts are anonymous. S two is that they don't keep archives. It's not Googleable. In fact, when new content comes in, it pushes off older content. 
So we, uh, we, we got five and a half million posts from this, from this site and simulated the dynamics of the site to ask what happens in a large scale online community when you have anonymity and ephemerality as core design tenets. We saw that the median thread lasted just five seconds in the intentional sphere of, of most people that is on the first page and was pushed off completely from the site within five minutes. In fact, we also found that over 90% of the posts were made completely anonymously. And we found some interesting ways in which uh, it was, there was a suggestion that these exact decisions of anonymity and ephemerality were what were leading to 4chan's ability to drive internet culture. If you've ever seen a lolcat, if you've ever been rickrolled, you have experienced the output of 4chan. So we can think about these kinds of questions of how to design these online communities as well. Uh, we can also talk about mining what crowds have already done. This is again work that tends to appear at HCI conferences like Kai and Wist. I'll focus here on some work that I did over the summer uh, with Sue and Jamie on tail answers. That's right, I missed another one, and Eric, thank you. Uh, I'm good for it. Uh, <laughs> All right, so, so answers you may be familiar with, or one box is something like this when you query for weather. Uh, in addition to the organic search results, you see something like this, which is a, a result that's been designed specifically, um, perhaps quite kind of sad in the case of Boston, uh, for that kind of query. But uh, we don't have any kind of response for, for something that is a much less common kind of query, like what are the substitutes for molasses, um, which we know to be actually collectively quite common. That is, they're in the tail. There is a, a large number of somewhat popular queries. So what we created was something called tail answers, where we can again augment these, these organic search results with a direct response telling you exactly what you would replace molasses with. In fact, we can create hundreds or thousands of these through an automated process, answering questions like how long dissolvable stitches last, the story of the invention of the light bulb, how to turn up the volume on Windows XP, um, many others that are all sort of collectively somewhat popular. And I'm sorry, in, in individually somewhat popular and collectively quite popular. Uh, so we really do turn to crowd data to make this happen. We can look for, uh, for search trails, like, like Ryan has been exploring, where we identify where people start searching, navigating through the web, and find pages where they have an, an unusually high probability of getting to that page and then ending their search session. If, if we combine that with looking for the canaries in the coal mine, a small number of searchers who use question words in their queries, like what is the average body temperature of a dog, we can start to identify web pages where people are finding concise informational answers to their, to their needs. We can then use something that looks a lot like Find, Fix, Verify to extract that content from the web and promote it into a direct response. So really there's a broad space here of crowd-powered interfaces and crowd-powered systems. We can talk about how we might pay people, how we can create new kinds of crowds to collect information that's never been collected before, how to look to what crowds have already been doing. So my goal really in the large scale is to integrate social and crowd intelligence directly as a core part of interaction, as software and of computation more generally. Now, Focusing just in the paid crowdsourcing space, there are a lot of ways to get there. We want to think about how we integrate crowds with machine learning for one. That is, we can already now start to deploy these systems, collect the data, and train better machine learning systems. But we can also then take these machine learning systems and use them to make the crowds more effective. For example, in tail answers, we found that by using an open information extraction, uh, open, open information extraction system, we can actually just have the crowds vet the answers, which ends up being much faster and, and cost less. We can also think about what happens when you say start treating these workers as, say, like stump learners in an, in an ensemble. We want to think about the platform. How would we change ODesk, Mechanical Turk, many of these systems, Top Coder? We, we, we've seen what happens when there's a small scale, like hundreds of individuals online at once. What happens when everyone is, is a contractor, effectively, that when we have hundreds of thousands of people participating? How do we help them develop expertise and, and notice when they have the expertise? How do we help with lifelong learning? What, what, is, what do benchmarks and complexity look like in this space? If you come up with a better algorithm, how do we actually compare and understand the ways in which it is better? And at a high level, we can start to talk about ways that we can combine machine and social intelligence to take on these really complex or high level tasks. Think of sort of the big questions, helping you write a lecture, write a symphony, big questions. Now this work opens up many cans of worms. Um, now, we don't have enough time to really get into an in-depth discussion here, but I want to give you a sense of the kinds of questions that I think about and that I think are important in this space. First is that we have this sort of returning notion of, of scientific management. Uh, 
How do we think about contract ethics in this space? How do we make sure that people in expectation make a living wage when they're doing piecework? What happens when your software has goals and dreams? That is, there are individuals participating as part of this system and you want to support their interactions socially, you want to give them the opportunities for career advancements. These are all important parts and I, will argue, and I would argue will lead to a better result if we think from that platform side. Finally, we've comp complicated notions of attribution, should we've had so uh, thousands of authors on the Soylent paper. Uh, on the flip side, if there's an error, who's now at fault? So these are just a few of the issues that I think we need to push on. So in the meantime, people have picked up Find, Fix, Verify to start doing things like image, segmenta image segmentation, like you can see in the upper right there, uh, authoring maps. They've modeled it using formal crowd languages. Um, it's been integrated into coursework at several universities. Uh, and more broadly, again, while Soylent was one of the first crowd-powered systems, I'd like to point out that there are lots of these systems that are really gaining traction in the research and practice space, uh, things helping with blind individuals, translation, databases, uh, it's a big space and I hope you'll come play with me in it. So I hope I've convinced you in this hour that we can in fact create these crowd powered systems that are going to enable experiences that you wouldn't be able to accomplish with just machine intelligence, but nor could crowds on their own perhaps do them either. We're creating a symbiotic system that actually plays to both of their strengths. And more generally I hope I've convinced you that computation can become a critical component of what's known as the wisdom of crowds. So I'm part of a small crowd of collaborators. Um, my closest mentor is Rob Miller and David Carger at MIT. A variety of researchers across many institutions, including here, graduate students, undergraduates, uh, and many others. So thanks to all of them. Uh, and at this point, I'd be happy to turn it around to discussion and questions. Thanks. Yes. One question about just your observation of the workers out there. The Workers. Yeah. I don't even have a sense what the total population of workers is. Has it been evolving over time? Is it moving east, moving west, staying spread out, et cetera, et cetera? Right. So I think this will continue to be a question. Um, the, late, the, the most recent information I've seen has sort of moving east, I guess, would be a good, a good characterization. So there are more workers in India than there used to be. Um, I think the model you want to keep in your head here is that people in the U.S. are using it to supplement their income. In India, Bill Thies is actually doing some really great work at MSR India, looking at ways in which people are actually replacing their income entirely in ways in which you can say use cell phone platforms or give, give people cell phones as a way to actually start expanding this. What, what, do you have any number? What's the total size of all of That's a great question. Amazon doesn't say. My estimate would be tens of thousands are signed up, but perhaps hundreds, maybe low thousands online at any given time. That might even be an overestimate. Um, I think that, that these platforms have a large space to grow. But still small. Yeah, I mean, I said five million tasks yeah. a year. Yeah. That's actually. I'm surprised how small that number was. Yeah, so if you think about who's actually using these largely, it's researchers and, um, and companies like Crowdflower that are using it to like, verify business listings and so on. Part of what I view my, my role here is, is, is in expressing the much broader space that crowds could really tackle. And by doing so, I hope that will push open the boundaries of, of what can happen. And then you look to things like Odesk, where there's real expertise. Like pe I've hired music engineers to help me create a song for Akai Madness last year. Um, law tech people, um, mathematicians, all exist on these platforms. So you'll start to see a continuum from Mechanical Turk, which is homogenous and sort of generic intelligence, out to things like Cro Odesk, where there's real expertise. I promise to come back to you in case I didn't, if I wasn't cleared. Are you happy? So, I, I, so the question at the beginning was why, uh, uh, why verify rather than rank? So verify would seem to return a boolean, and rank would, uh, would, would assume that it takes an input of multiple things and, and can give the best, or it can take an input of one thing and, uh, so, and, and just rank it. So I guess I was saying why be specific when you could be general? He, absolutely, you could. Um, Eric's done some th thinking on how to do generic sorting using crowds. That would be another way you could do this. That's effectively rank, right? Um, so now you have sort of noisy comparators, effectively. Um, you know, really what we're getting is a histogram that is for each, for each of those pieces of text, we're getting a number of votes that it's bad. Um, so in a sense, we can get a noisy rank from that, and it's just a matter of what you do with it. 
But you're right that you could push out more generally and consider the ver verify is, is a notion that's semantic, right? That means like we're trying to effectively get a notion of what's good and bad, but you could imagine rank being a better term for that if you wanted. Yeah. Uh, so one thing people often ask about crowdsourcing, you know, what, what domains can you apply it to? And I think you gave a lot of really compelling examples, but maybe you could talk a little bit about generalizing some of the things you talked about, like task decomposition to find things verified. You have a few examples, um, but can that apply, you know, is task decomposition the key to sort of any domain? And how might that play yeah. into tasks you might try and do in advance at, at sort of the system level? Yeah. So I think about this in the following way. Right now, I mean, I can view this as a, as a, as a, as a limit. Like, theorists want to know what are the limits of this. But you can also view it as a research challenge, as you know, what can we engineer in the future? There's sort of a weird space in the middle there. One thing that crowds are currently quite poor at is anything that requires high-level knowledge. That is, if you wanted to actually have your entire paper shortened, you probably would. You, you, it, there's this orthogonal element in which we give every paragraph and have it shortened individually. But when I shorten a text, it also happens by me saying, this section just feels really wordy, or I could just cut this paragraph entirely. And if you want to make those kinds of assertions, or imagine you wanted to build a crowdsourced personal assistant, someone who'd help you order pizza, reserve rooms, set up meetings, they would need to have some globally consistent knowledge of who you are and that you don't like anchovies, right? How do you build those very large scale kinds of, of, of pieces of understanding across lots of distributed tasks seems like a very hard problem. Um, in particular, you can think about you know, how much time it takes someone to get up to speed on a task um, with, in comparison to how, how much it takes them to actually do the work. So it takes me forever to sort of figure out what it is I need to do and, and get the expertise and read the text, and then I sort of hit yes or no. Um, it's not right now a good match for crowdsourcing. But we don't have a good sense of that curve and sort of how quickly it drops off. That would be a great thing to do. Eric? So one of the interesting topics you covered, um, which which particular challenge really gets you excited for the next few years in terms of what you really focus your attention? I think that start pushing out bigger, exactly what I was what I was suggesting. You know, start pushing out from sort of not toy systems, but things that are taking on simple tasks to things that really start solving complex interdependent problems is I think really hard and really exciting if we can make it happen. And you have a sense that the technologies are sub challenges you have to deal with. Well, I, I mean, I, I think about whether you could start attacking that through sort of sampling-based approaches or whether you could actually create mini management structures within the crowd to start taking on those kinds of things. Um, I have no clue whether that will work, but that's sort of what's exciting about it. Um, certainly, I, I also think really at a high level, pushing at bringing crowd data into interactive applications is a hugely underexplored space in HCI right now. Um, and I, I'm perhaps preaching to the choir here. Uh, <laughs> But I, I really do think that that's another thing that has huge legs that we can push on. Yes? So you've been talking about this integrating crowd intelligence into software systems, right? Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on how you might want to ensure reliability? Like, you know, there's a word spell checker. I know that it's not as good as editors, but I know that it, it works, right? Yeah. But these crowdfund systems, who knows, maybe the workers are not going to be as good as the, um, my workers are not as good as your workers. Great point. So, you know, another way to put this would be if I run CrowdProof three times, I'm going to get a bunch of different suggestions, right? I, I may not get the same things twice. Um, that's a hard problem. <laughs> but I think that, that it is something we need to start addressing. I pointed out that reliability in terms of latency was really important. But you're absolutely right that uh, in addition, we need to think about sort of reliability in terms of repeatability. Um, great point. I have nothing to add, but I think that it's important. <laughs> Uh, yes, Scott. So when I, as I think through like all the different places you can apply crowd power systems, you've already shown like at least one or two ways that you can apply to like say the office suite. And I started thinking through it and I, and I have a whole bunch of ideas of ways that you could totally change your experience with PowerPoint or, or, or other kinds of desktop applications. At the same time, I think one of the things that those software systems let you do is they let you use it in like a corporate environment where perhaps you're not trying to have public disclosure, where you're trying to construct something where you're talking about what you're going to do against your competitor. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the software systems are nice because they're kind of like private to you and they're reliable in that way. What do you think about um, how do you have uh, the crowd as a consultant 
under NDA, or how do you have privacy, or how do you prevent well, you stuff? you transfer from, the problem into a sort of obfuscated <laughs> thing. That yeah, so. Yeah, or how do you prevent <laughs> your stuff, your creative works from being ripped off and released before you release them? Like, if, uh, I just published your next paper, by the way. No, well, that's, <laughs> I can appreciate that. Um, <laughs> like, you know, if, if you're in the business of making a creative work, that's right. Uh, you don't want to have the first chapter edited by the crowd and then released online. That's right. So what you start to see already is that companies are getting contracted crowds, not from Mechanical Turk, but under NDA. Several companies are doing this. Um, so you can sort of have a, um, a sort of your own on-demand crowd that you size dynamically as you need based on the, the needs of the enterprise. Um, but yeah, you could also think about like homomorphic crowdsourcing, right? What would it mean to actually take it and reliably obfuscate the, the critical parts in such a way that the work can still be done? Um, but, but also, yeah, thinking, I mean, you were sort of pointing towards what happens as you go off the desktop and what's getting crowdsourced is stuff about, you know, where I am at any given point. Um, there, we're just starting to see people think about this. I think Jason Hong is starting to think about it, for example, and his students. Um, but it's going to be, it's going to be a fun ride, for sure, cool. at the very least. Any more questions? Thank you. Okay.